Okay, Professor Green, so uh, you have the first opportunity to respond. Well, first of all, let me say thank you to Doug. Uh, I have to say that I had no idea uh, of uh, our history. I was actually, we're working on the second edition of the Dictionary of Jesus and the Gospels right now, and so I've recently reread your essay, and uh, now I know. <laughs> This is the Doug who wrote the essay, so thank you so much for uh, all of the history that we've shared. Um, there are a couple of things that I might talk about. Um, one issue is an issue of language, and I'm interested in hearing both from Doug and from John uh, on that score, because I'm, I'm happy to be um, uh, instructed on what better language to use. It seems to me that my, my uh, language, monism, uh, is problematic, but it's problematic in ways that I don't understand. That is, it's problematic in ways uh, the, the responses don't strike at the root of what I'm trying to say. And for that reason, I wonder what it is that you hear me saying that I don't mean to say. <laughs> and one of those things in particular that's interesting, uh, Doug, is uh, you seem to think that, I'm that I want to leave the soma, the body, uh, in the same state it was under a dualistic notion. But if I take soma, body, the way that I understand scripture in the New Testament to use it, then I can't any longer think of soma in the same way. Uh, it's one of the things that Hasker, Bill Hasker talks about from time to time when he talks about these... these uh, uh, incredible things the body can do, which the body under certain dualisms could never do. Uh, and the Soma, in my understanding of New Testament theology, is actually capable of far more things. And I don't know how to say that in a way that you guys hear. And so that's one issue that I, I'd really like to, to have some conversation about. I don't also understand Doug, it must be that I haven't communicated well with regard to how to read Matthew 10, 28. Uh, the idea that I would be suggesting that we read Matthew 10, 28 per Luke is something that I would never imagine doing. I uh, said that only by way of saying that if one takes Matthew 10, 28 as a reference from the historical Jesus, one runs into the immediate problem of the language issue and the two versions of the saying. And if you take the Lucan version as representing the historical Jesus, then Matthew 10, 28 has to be understood in a different way. So somehow I haven't communicated that well enough because you take issue with, uh, with what I was actually offering as a, as a nonsense case. Uh, the other issue uh, that I'm not sure what you're going to do with, though, with Matthew 10, 28, is that it doesn't support your view of the afterlife. It has both body and soul in Gehenna, and that would not be a traditional anthropological perspective. Uh, we, we disagree on the intermediate state, but only you and I know that, because you weren't able to read that part of the essay. <laughs> And I also have to say, I don't understand what to make of your talk about the second person of the Trinity. I don't know why my position introduces a Holy Ghost in a machine. I actually hear your position as one of the earliest heresies <laughs> thrown out. <laughs> so I can't imagine that's what you're trying to say. Uh, but the idea that uh, there is an ontological unity of a material substance with a spiritual substance sounds like what some tried to argue in the fourth century of a, a body uh, that did not have a soul but had the divine logos. Well, and, and that's the heresy I'm talking about. The, the view that's put forward in the creeds uh, is that Jesus is 100% human, 100% God, uh, not part this or part that. And so I'm not sure how it is that my view is problematic, and I'm not sure how your view isn't. So I'd, I'd like to, uh, to hear you say more about that.
But more than anything else, I appreciate the fact that um, you see that one of the issues that we're dealing with is what to make of texts, uh, what to make of, of larger issues. And if I uh, could just say one thing uh, related to the conversation that just went on between you two. One of the points that I think is important to make on the hermeneutical end of things is that science is not a new thing uh, that people are now reading scripture from the perspective of. Uh, science was already a perspective from which scripture was being read in the second century, in the third century, in the fourth century. It isn't naturalistic science. It isn't what we today call science based on the new science that was introduced in the 17th century. But what Philo was doing was, uh, what do you call it? Uh, philosophical, theological science. He was... He was reading Genesis 127 from the perspective of the science that he embraced. And so it's not the case that people ever escape the scientific perspectives from which they operate. The question is, and this goes along with what you were saying, John, who's hermeneutic and so on. The question is, who's science? Because science is always there, uh, whether we were noticing, expecting or not. So that's an issue that I'd like for us to discuss as well. Well, um, what I, so we want to have John have a chance to respond to Jason. Maybe let's do that first, and then we've got uh, that uh, done. And then I, I guess, Doug, I want to know if you have thoughts and response. John, if you've got thoughts and response, and we want to get the audience in, too. So maybe we'll start with you uh, responding to Jason. Do, do I need to use the hand? Thanks. Yeah, I want to thank uh, Jason for his comments. They were generous and they were perceptive, so giving me the benefit of the doubt, um, even when I perhaps didn't deserve it from the text. Um, let me just say a couple of things. I don't want in any way to hermet hermetically seal off um, the biblical worldview from science and philosophy. I just don't want them to confuse, because Joel is right, that often people have tried to say, well, the Bible teaches and now it turns out to be Cartesianism, or Platonism, or Aristotelianism, or something like this. I don't want that, and it's the wrong way to read scripture. Um, but scripture is realistic, and it does give us a worldview, and I think it's in the biblical worldview that we have something that's universal. It's cross-cultural, and it endures through the ages, and that's the framework uh, from which we do science. I mean, in my tradition, Abraham Kuyper, it's the Christian worldview from which we engage in the sciences and in philosophy, but we don't think the Bible gives us a straightforward philosophy. And so I was trying to make that distinction and so cut off some perhaps wrong philosophical and or scientific readings of the Bible in, in your sense, Joel. I, I'm not sure that I always, I mean, I'm Westminster Confession that way. I think the Bible is the final authority, and I'm just going to confess that ahead of time. And so I'm not going to agree quite that uh, no source is privileged a priori when conflicts arise. The Bible's got to be right unless it's shown to be wrong. And maybe some, you know, I mean, okay, the age of the earth or whatever it is, people didn't read it that way. But, I mean, there were times when I don't care what science says, I'm going to stick to something. I mean, I'm sticking to the historical Adam and Eve right now, even though I know all about the out of Africa kind of hypothesis and that stuff. Um, and Christian physicists and cosmologists had to do that for a very long time when physics said the universe is everlasting. Didn't have a beginning. I mean, we got off the hook in the 1950s and 60s when the Big Bang came along and everybody breathed a collective sigh of relief. But before that, um, Christian, intelligent, scientifically trained Christians just needed to bite the bullet and confess creatio ex nihilo no matter what science said. And I'm sticking with them. So, uh, but, but what you say about the integration, and, and I, I mean, that's, that's very, very good. And if I had time, I would have said it. So I thank you for that. Okay, so uh, Doug and John, did you want to have a little interaction with Joel about the things that he raised? Or um, sure, yeah, I'll uh, try to respond to some of, the, of Joel's questions. Um, the uh, language question that uh, Joel also pitched to uh, John, I'll go first on that. Um, uh, I guess my concern is to uh, use um, our terms more carefully. I, 
I, I don't mind your use of the term monism, uh, the idea that humans are made of one substance. Um, my objection was, um, it sounds like when you use the phrase, the essential unity of human existence, um, that, that that was interchangeable with the word monism. Now, indeed, uh, monism maybe is interchangeable with that phrase, but that phrase is not only and always equal to monism. All that to say is I think a dualist can insist upon the essential unity of human existence. Um, so the widespread uh, New Testament scholarship trend to focus on the essential unity of human existence does not mean that they're all monists now. Uh, um, and that's why I, I, I've liked um, John's the title for your position, which is, looks like it's changed. It used to be holistic dualism, yeah. and now it's dualistic holism. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was pointed out to me that uh, Scripture does emphasize unity first. Yeah. Yeah. Not it's by Joel, but if it came from Joel, <laughs> I would have accepted it. I would have accepted it. Yeah. So I think, I, I actually kind of like that we're all together on that uh, idea, and um, that monism doesn't have the, the corner on the unity market. So that's what I was getting at in that language issue. Um, the interpretation of Matthew 10, 28. Um, there's two legs to that verse. Uh, Matthew 10, 28 is the passage that says, don't be afraid of those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Instead, fear him who can destroy both the body and the soul in hell. Um, it, it's interesting, I think you're right. Uh, monists have trouble with the first leg. Dualists will have trouble with the second leg of that passage. But um, a, a full-bodied, uh, historic, yeah, that's, that's kind of funny. You know, <laughs> a full-bodied, a robust, uh, holistic dualism actually believes that second leg pretty strongly uh, because we think that there's a general resurrection and people will suffer bodily. Uh, in hell. So I don't think it's as problematic as it might look like at, uh, on the surface. Um, and then, I'm sorry, I, I was running out of time and so I rushed through my, uh, my stuff on the incarnation, um, which is, yeah, given church history, it's a terrible thing to rush through uh, your explanation on the incarnation. Um, so um, I'm sorry about that. Um, uh, what I was trying to get at is uh, a dualism, um, understanding human uh, composition as containing both physical and non-physical components has a place for the incarnation to happen. Um, if, if Jesus of Nazareth was only a physical person, then how did the non-physical second person of the Trinity get in there? And that's where Gilbert Ryle's Ghost in the Machine uh, dualism actually comes to rest uh, on a monistic view. Um, I think that on a monist account, Jesus of Nazareth was a full human without the second person of the Trinity being there and the second person of the Trinity gets in there, then what is his death experience? The body part dies, and the spirit part gets whisked away. Um, but on a dualist account, where Jesus of Nazareth is 100% human and 100% divine, when he dies, the spiritual and physical parts are, are violently rendered apart from one another. That's what death is. So now the second person of the Trinity does experience death. It's not just the spirit part wisping away, but it's a, it's a true death. Uh, so uh, yeah, I wasn't trying to commit any uh, heresy. In fact, some people might suggest that, that monism is more likely to be slipping into uh, one of the historic uh, heresies. Uh, did that help? <laughs> well, we can uh, debate that. But let, let, uh, let, me, because re I, let me respond I to Joe. I haven't had the, his... the language you're using apart 
is already uh, problematic as a description of the incarnation, but uh, I'm not sure so, we're going to solve so that issue here. Or aspects or, yeah, yeah. John. Uh, Joel, what you call monism, I think I agree with, um, almost without qualification. I would have a problem if you think that means that sort of constitutionally um, there couldn't be two inputs to, to constitute one substance. I mean, Aristotle is a monist in the sense that a human being is a single thing, but form and matter are metaphysically irreducibly different, and so he's a dualist with respect to constitutive elements or whatever you want to call them, although he's a monist with respect to one substance. So monism gets used in a whole bunch of different uh, ways. My, my big problem, as you know, is it, when monism means that it's not possible for persons to exist uh, immaterially, then, then uh, then, then, then I think uh, it conflicts with scripture, and I don't think that a lot of monism, or all monisms entail that. I mean, I think uh, that uh, Dean Zimmerman, uh, the, the fissure thing, whatever you think of that as science and philosophy, would be a form of monism, where an intermediate state, where a personal dichotomy uh, would be possible. And uh, so, for monism to just entail the denial of uh, any intermediate state or even the possibility of an intermediate state, or that's his Greek idea, I mean, I just think that's all confused. But with respect to the unity of human nature and the, the unity of the human life and the unity of human ministry, I mean, when you write about that stuff, I totally agree with you. And so maybe that's what I mean by holism or integral. But I think that's where the tradition was. I mean, St. Augustine said this, the soul as a whole is in every part of the body, in every hair follicle, and Thomas Aquinas would have said the same thing. And when I read, you know, 16th and 17th and 18th century and 19th and 20th century reformed dogmaticians from my own tradition, I mean, the, the emphasis on unity and integration and where, where these things start and the other one stops is so totally different. When I hear you criticize uh, uh, traditional dualists or, or trichotomists, I mean, I would totally agree that people who read the Bible like that, that's kind of odd. I just don't think that most of the tradition did that. Um, certainly not in my tradition. In fact, there's a, there's a Dutch synod, a Dutch reform synod in around 1650 that condemned Descartes because he was too rationalist and he was too dualist. This is a Dutch reformed synod of the church. They wanted much more integration, spiritually, in terms of ministry in the world. So in our tradition, I mean, Kuiper and Bobbing, these guys, you know, they're every square inch and Christian newspapers and universities and all, everything. They're dualists, and they, they, there was just never any problem with this. Mm -hmm. Matthew, um, I don't see what the problem is because we, there's a resurrection to judgment. Book of Revelation, so that's what it means when God destroys both body and soul in Gehenna. You get eternal death, body and soul. There are people in this life that can just kill you, but your soul can go to be with the Lord, or it can go to the, the holding pen for Gehenna but then there's a final resurrection to judgment. Now, Matthew doesn't go into all that stuff, but as you know, there are at least some in Second Temple Judaism that hold that view, and Matthew is, is consistent with that view as it is with a, with a kind of a monism or, or anything like that. So I don't, I don't think it's any more trouble for a dualist than it is for a monist. What, was there anything else? I'm not sure. We'll keep going and see. Sure. <laughs> do you want to? So, Joel, do you want to respond? And then I'll open it up to the well, audience. Let me, let me just say one thing that occurs to me as I listen to John. Uh, one of the issues between John and me is that I'm not reformed. <laughs> it's, I, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, those when, he, who be called, he sanctified, and those who be sanctified, he glorified. <laughs> when you talk about the, the, the doctrinal tradition, uh, you're talking about the Reformed tradition more than you are talking about my Wesleyan tradition. Yeah, but I mean, Wes I've read Wesley. Look, you want to know what my name is? John Wesley. There is hope. <laughs> but I'm a Calvinist, okay? <laughs> well, what Wesley, I mean, what he, But he the 39 articles of our church don't address, for example, the intermediate state in the way that your tradition requires the intermediate state. 
Well, they just took it, its truth for granted. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we've got roving microphones, and I'm sure plenty of you have questions. I see questions in back there, so. And here's Richard. Go ahead, Richard. Thank you. Uh, I wonder if the speakers would become a little clearer about what they think they're doing by hermeneutics. Um, I think uh, a lot of what they said suggested they are trying, at any rate at stage one, to find the orig uh, or original meaning of the text. Now, if that's right, then it's highly ambiguous because it uh, depends what counts as the text and it depends on who, and who is supposed to be its author. If the text, for, as we all know, the Bible was put together by little snippets being added to other snippets, being put together into streams, being put together into books, being put together into an Old Testament and so on. And uh, uh, the meaning of a passage is going to depend on what larger whole it seemed to belong to. Uh, so, as it were, uh, just to take one example, uh, the prophecy uh, of Isaiah, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, uh, in its original meaning, I suppose this was the prophecy to King Ahab that he would, he has, uh, he would bear a son. Uh, but if it's seen as part of a larger Bible uh, and quoted by Matthew, is it, as having a certain, uh, having application to Christ, and this is seen as a whole book, then since this later part tells us how it's to be interpreted, that's what it means. And then, Secondly, it all depends on who you think the author of a part is. If you think it's the human writer who wrote it down, then it's going to mean one thing, it, because you interpret a text in the light of the beliefs of who you believe to be the author. Because if you know the author believes so-and-so, and the text seems to be pretty in, uh, incompatible with that, you interpret the text in the metaphorical sense. Okay. So the text is going to mean one thing if you think it's written by Isaiah and quite another thing if you think it's written or at any rate inspired by God because God knows certain things that Isaiah doesn't know. Now, uh, coming to, uh, this, uh, coming to uh, 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 the uh, particular issue at stake, uh, which is the compatibility of certain things in the Bible with certain... Uh, philosophico-scientific uh, issues about the nature of human beings. Now, uh, God presumably knows the answer to these questions. And if you think that the uh, text was written by God, uh, although uh, superficially if you thought it was written by someone else uh, who had rather less uh, good views, um, you wouldn't interpret it as uh, in, ter uh, in terms of the, the human author's view, you would interpret it in the light of God's view and you would see this as a rather unsatisfactory way or a metaphorical way or having some other meaning than what you would interpret it as having if you thought the human author was doing this. Um, now, uh, uh, so it all depends what you think you're doing by humanutics. And this is brought out, for example, very clearly in Augustine's approach to scripture, and let's take uh, his commentary on Genesis. Um, his commentary on Genesis, the, the one day, uh, Genesis ad literam, uh, what, what he uh, is investigating here is uh, the compatibility of the opening chapters of Genesis with what on the whole, he believed, uh, um, on the basis of Greek science. And uh, there are certain passages which are superficially incompatible with Greek science, and he tries to reconcile them. Uh, but he says, uh, at a very crucial point, he said, should it turn out that Greek science really does establish so-and-so, he doesn't say we must reinterpret scripture, he says that would show what scripture originally meant, mm. that would show what God meant by the scripture. So uh, I wonder perhaps if you would uh, enlighten us as to what you are doing when you are trying to find the original 
original meaning of the text because uh, there are various ways in which you might understand original meaning of the text. Well, yeah, that's uh, it's why my paper, although it was 40 minutes, couldn't uh, do much more than scratch the surface. But the, the problems you pose are genuine problems, but they certainly have been understood by the hermeneutical tradition. I mean, there's a distinction between trying to find out what Isaiah meant, or if they're in a particular passage, and if you think there are multiple authors uh, to Isaiah, um, the point would be that somebody redacted the text and put it together so that we have a single canonical book. And now the job is whatever was meant by the individual authors, it forms a whole. A, te a textual whole, and then you try to interpret all the verses in the light of the whole structure of the book. But the tradition never played off God the Holy Spirit from the human authors. In fact, uh, the scripture says that uh, God inspired, all scripture is inspired of God, and you know the text, right? There's one. And so one tries to uh, read the book as having a certain, a particular book as having integrity, but then the book within the canon as a whole, all the while assuming that God, the Holy Spirit, is behind the whole process. And that's the movement from exegesis to the interpretation of Scripture as a whole. And um, if the New Testament takes an Old Testament text, it could be both true that it meant one thing at the Old Testament, and by God's providence and the inspiration of Scripture, it uh, means what Matthew sa says it means in the New Testament. And so it goes with the views of Paul and with everything. And then it's a, the interpretation of the church because scripture, God gives scripture through the church. Jesus didn't hand the New Testament to Peter just before he ascended into heaven. He went into heaven and then he inspired the scriptures and uh, the church put the canon together and the church interprets the canon. And I think that the church's role in interpreting scripture is really quite important. Uh, even though I'm a Protestant, uh, Human author might be confused about what his text meant. Well, I don't uh, disagree with that. Um, pardon? I say I don't disagree with that. All right. Well, in that case, uh, the human author, uh, if you are trying to find out what the human author meant by it, uh, and you uh, acknowledge God as the inspirer of Scripture, though not dictating every word, and therefore the human author might have one understanding and God might have another understanding. I should have thought what you should be looking for is what God meant by the scripture, not what the human author meant. And, the, and part of the way to find that out is to find out God's other beliefs. And if God's, God knows the truth about mind and body, um, when we have discovered that, and to the extent we have discovered that, we've discovered something about God's beliefs, and so something about what God meant by the text. Yeah, well, see, I don't disagree with that either. And in my paper, I mean, maybe I wasn't quite articulate, but I don't ever think that I referred to what the human author meant. What I asked was what the text meant, you know, at the time when it was written. So maybe we have knowledge of an author, maybe we have knowledge of a community's interpretation. But in the end, if I think that God inspired the text, then it's really what God intends to teach through the, through the text. And that I did say when I, uh, in the section, when I moved from individual exegesis, to the formulation of biblical doctrine as a whole, then it's what God intends to teach the church for all time and all places. So uh, complicated as getting the right answers to these questions is, the Christian tradition has had a good solid method and I think a good view of the conclusions of that method when it works. And I think that we assume that it works really quite regularly and that we should stick with the church as taught until we have really good reason to give it up. Let me well, just say one more thing about this where I might disagree with you, I'm not sure. And that is, it sounds to me like I can have access to God's mind without reference to scripture. Yes. And what I'd like to say is that scripture is part of how we know God's mind. Uh, though God has more books, as it were, uh, than scripture. God has the book of the world he's created. So uh, I'm not sure that I want to go all the way down the road with you on this one. 
I think of Luke, for example, my favorite uh, example. Uh, Luke likes to say that we interpret scripture by means of God's purpose, God's boule, his, his agenda, but Luke also understands that we know God's purpose through scripture so that there's a circularity at work between what God has uh, purposed and how we understand scripture. So what we need is a, a, an authorized hermeneut who turns out in the Gospel of Luke to be Jesus, whom we trust as one who understands God's purpose and therefore reads scripture well and therefore understands God's purpose and therefore reads scripture well. So I, I, I want to ensure that my hermeneutic includes not only uh, the kinds of issues that you might have been thinking about, but also scripture itself. Let's let Tim into the conversation and back. All right. Um, my question is also a hermeneutical question. Um, it's different from, but I think complementary to Richard's. His is more of a kind of full-scale assault, whereas I'm trying to poke a little bit, I think, uh, at, at John uh, in the first instance, just because your paper talked about this, but but I'd be happy for others to address it too. It's just the question of, can you, can you allow space for uh, a, an author of scripture to either express or possibly intimate a view on something, including human nature as a particular case, um, where that not be something that's being taught by scripture, even though it is being expressed by the author in scripture or perhaps better in, you know, hint to that, uh, so, you know, an example would be um, uh, the writer of early chapters of Genesis. I think there's clear, very strong reason to think there's an expression or intimation of the three-storied universe conception, right? But we don't think Scripture teaches that. So, uh, and I just, um, and I'm not saying all of your case for um, what Paul's, Paul's anthropology uh, could could easily fall into that model, but if, in, in some cases, I'm just worried that you would want to point to certain texts where you're saying, look, it's clear Paul's kind of probably thinking along these lines, but it's not clear to me that we've got to immediately conclude, ah, that's being taught by Scripture, the way to think about human beings. No, I think that's an important distinction, and I would certainly uh, concede that. Um, I think the formula is that Scripture is infallible and true in all that it teaches. And now that, that raises the hermeneutical question, well, what does it teach? And so then we go back through the circle again. And, uh, you know, some, J Jason is right. Sometimes when we learn things about science, then it does help us figure out what Scripture actually meant. And I think that's what Augustine meant with respect to Greek science and uh, the early chapters of Genesis as well. I mean, I'm, I'm not a recent creationist, okay? I mean, I think the universe is as old as the scientists say that it is, and it has unfolded and developed and all that sort of thing. And uh, the Genesis writers had no idea about that, neither did St. Paul. But I still think that, I mean, they do teach that God structured the universe and God placed humans at the center of the universe, uh, sort of mediator between heaven and earth in a certain way. And that's what imaging God is about and having dominion and reflecting glory back to God. And, and those things are enduring teachings, and they would, per, you know, uh, apply as true, no matter what the scientific worldview is. So yeah, there's lots of things. I mean, I myself, um, I know that Paul would not have uh, allowed women to be ordained. I myself understand Scripture in such a way that those uh, that that might, might not be the enduring teaching of Scripture for once and for all. I mean, that looks to me a little bit. I don't want to get into that or, or get anything going, but I'm giving you an illustration of many things that I think are in Scripture, but just because it's in Scripture, you know, Paul thought this, that, that, that doesn't mean that that's infallible. And there, but there are ways of trying to identify what he teaches and what he doesn't, and we just don't always agree about that. Okay. Uh, there's a hand up. Ah, there we go. Go ahead, you, yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you for Professor Cooper or any of you who know. Uh, I'm a missionary to Jewish people and a specialist in Jewish studies, though not in this area of uh, the Hebraic view of human nature, human anthropology so much. But I'm researching and wanting to write an essay on recovering the Hebraic roots of the faith, both to build bridges with the Jewish people, but also for our own sake in the church. Uh, 
Do you think it's accurate to construct a Hebraic holism as a view of human nature? To call it Hebraic holism, is there enough Hebraic worldview in Scripture that we can call it Hebraic and have it be an accurate biblical view objectively of human nature? Is there a Hebraic holistic view of human nature? Or, or, or do we have to call it something else beyond Hebraic? Well, that's a really interesting question because if you read the Old Testament and then you do um, anthropological studies, I mean, the sort of animism that you find in many tribal cultures and uh, you know, pre-literate societies and that sort of thing would be quite similar to the sort of holism that is Hebrew. So that doesn't mean it's not uniquely inspired or normative or something like this. It's just that we overdo the uniqueness of this sometimes. There's you know, quite a few Greeks that also have an animistic view and it's much less, I mean, Plato and Parmenides and Pythagoras uh, were exceptions to the Greek. You know, Gr Greek and dualism is a, is a bad mistake. The dualists among the Greeks were also in the minority as far as I can tell. Professor uh, Swinburne knows a lot more about the history of philosophy than I do, but. Um, so, so we have to be real careful with this, but then once again, if you want to construct this thing, I mean, I am in conversation with at least two rabbis, one, con one very conservative and the other rather liberal, and you're going to get two different versions of what Hebraic holism stands for, and Joel's going to agree with me on that. There's a, the different Jewish traditions, and there were even at the time of Jesus. I mean, the Sadducees and the Pharisees didn't agree on this. So we, we have to be careful, once again, you know, developing our abstractions and then finding them in the text. I totally agree with that. And, and we're all prone to it, and it's an ongoing process of trying to purify ourselves from those things, but, I mean, you know, Hebrew holism versus Greek dualism or any other thing like this is just an abstraction. It never really existed. Okay, in back, yeah. Uh, I have a question for uh, Professor Green. Um, on your, I have a question regarding your comment on uh, Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, the verse that uh, Prima Facie supports dualism. Uh, I remember, if I remember correctly, you made a point that this verse can't be taken to represent Christ's views because Christ's language was Aramaic, whereas the Matthew passage was written in Greek, but my question is, why can't we just extend this same reasoning to all the sayings of Christ such that we'll end up with agnosticism with respect to the, what Christ's views actually were? What did you say? You can end up with agnosticism if you, if you universalize that. About the saying of Jesus, we never get what Jesus Oh, I, I, uh, if I understand your, your question correctly, um, you're maybe suggesting that I have a slippery slope argument. Uh, and you may remember from my comment that I said one can't take this text simply as uh, the words of Jesus of Nazareth. And the word simply there is the important word. Um, if one wants to talk about what Jesus actually said, then a good bit more work needs to be done than simply quoting an English translation of a Greek text uh, that presumably is representing an Aramaic saying. That's all I was trying to say, that uh, it's, it's not simply the case that one can read off of the English text that uses the word soul and assume, therefore, that Jesus is a body soul dualist. Uh, this gentleman in front has had his hand up for a little while. Maybe we can get him. Uh, this remark in question is directed to all the speakers. Your papers have treated us to the Sitzim Leben of the New Testament scriptures, um, the methodology of hermeneutics, hi intellectual history. Now, for those of us who are interested in the bottom line, okay, yes or no, is there a discernible philosophical anthropology in the New Testament scriptures? 
Is there a philosophy of mind that the New Testament scriptures teaches? Or is there is a just philosophy a, of mind, did you say? Yes. No. Not, not ex I don't think that there is one explicitly taught. Um, and I'm going to be open to the philosophers uh, to say whether one is entailed by what scripture teaches. My own view is that there are several different philosophical views, okay? Augustine and Aquinas and, uh, you know, maybe, uh, maybe the Fisher view or whatever it is. There's, there's several of them that are, would be consistent with both the sort of Joel's monism or my holism or integral existence on the one hand, and then what I would, uh, I want an intermediate state before a final resurrection would be consistent with both. Now, if, the, if that's the actual uh, redemptive narrative, then what happens to us, then we have to have a metaphysics about human nature that doesn't undercut that. But whether at the end of the day there's just one philosophical position that captures that, I'm not convinced of that yet. Or may, maybe it's like this, that we've got to have, put all the philosophical views side by side and then uh, see whether one is better than the other ones on all other issues and also this issue. And then that would be the philosophical position that has king of the hill because it would be warranted by scripture and it would be warranted by philosophical reason and philosophers uh, who are reasonable people would all be able to see that it was. <laughs> Not a, if you mean by a, f a philosophical system, okay, Cartesianism versus Kantianism versus Husserl versus, you know, uh, uh, William James versus a guy. No, 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 no. The Bible is not that specific. John, no, I quite uh, agree. I think that the, uh, the reality is that uh, philosophy of mind has developed uh, categories that are actually quite alien. Uh, to the, the thought processes that we find going on in the New Testament. Uh, the reason that I use the, 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 uh, the simple term, what I think is a simple term, monism, is that I think it is compatible with a range of possibilities uh, that are represented by various viewpoints, uh, whether that's, I, I forget whose name it is, deep physicalism. Uh, I have colleagues who, who think that non-reductive physicalism is the appropriate response. Uh, I have colleagues who think about emergent monism. And I, th I, th I think that monism is compatible with a whole range of things. In fact, I think that uh, the work that I've tried to do is mostly a way of pushing aside the far right and the far left of the choices that are available to us today so that in spite of what appear to be differences between uh, myself and, say, John Cooper, uh, we're actually much closer to each other in the middle than either of us is to the other end of the spectrum. I agree. Uh, that, that we're a part of. And I'm quite happy to say the New Testament is, is supportive of those kinds of things, even if I disagree with John on details, in part because I think the New Testament doesn't speak with the kind of single philosophical voice that would satisfy my philosophical friends in the 21st century. So let me re-ask the question. What is, I'm going to make it as simple as possible, what is our hope? What is our resurrection hope? What is going to happen? When I die, I mean, let's make this as simple as possible. Yeah. When I die, what does the scripture teach? You are going to be with the Lord. <laughs> and See, but that's not philosophy, that's the gospel, man. I mean, it's true, it's real, it's ontic, but it's not ontology. So Heidegger distinguishes between ontic, you know, and ontology. This is not theory, this is not philosophy, this is just the truth of the matter. Now, exactly what that's gonna be like, I, I mean, I don't know. My mother's there, you know, she used to ask me when I was writing a book, John, what's gonna happen, you know? So I used to try to, Tell, tell her, my, my mother passed away. Now my mother knows she's with the Lord and she could write the book, but. <laughs> John, let me, let me ask you, one way of hearing you um, 
is that you think the scripture is committed to uh, a future resurrection and an intermediate state. Yeah. And there are different uh, philosophical anthropologies that can accommodate that data, exactly. some of which are monistic, materialist, others, others are more dualist. Is it? Yeah, I, I think that's right? right. See, I would still prefer, um, I mean, non-reductive is, you know, is really necessary because the phenomenology of consciousness and, and, and just empirical, uh, you know, the distinction that Professor Swinburne started with this morning, I mean, that's, that's absolutely not overcomable. And uh, any kind of monism is gonna have trouble with this. Now, whether you get two substances from that, I don't know, but so, so there, uh, I, I do prefer a kind of a dual dimension or dual ingredient or however you're gonna go. Uh, there's a lot of good reasons for philosophical dualism, but those are philosophical issues and I'm interested in them and I used to work with them, but I've become a theologian and so now I'm coming at it from the other side. I'm trying to be as clear as I think what, you know, I can be about what scripture teaches and there's nothing original in what I say. I mean, it's basically what the tradition has been saying all along uh, in, in a variety of ways. So, uh, but that's when you die you are immediately in the presence of the Lord, whatever that is like, and then when it's time for the resurrection, uh, however the two times are related, that's what's going to happen. Okay, that's difficult, but when you say you will be with the Lord, well, who's the you, okay? And how will it be? Right? Well, you got a body double, or? I'm not sure any philosophy is being presupposed by that statement. Do you have some idea about who you are? I mean, you know who you are, right? I don't know you yet. We haven't met. But I wonder about it every day. Okay. Well, maybe you don't need a theologian. Maybe you need to talk to somebody else. Uh, John, you, John, there was one line in your paper uh, that I think speaks to this gentleman's question. You said of all the various, there's, there's no single passage of scripture that covers all the data, um, that provides all the information for a full-bodied philosophical answer to the anthropological composition question. But you did say that you thought uh, your holistic dualism or dualistic holism uh, uh, holistic dualism is uh, is the uh, you thought that your I'm view closer to, <laughs> closer to green there, so I want yeah. holism that you you suggested that your view is the one that most easily handles all the snippets of uh, scriptural data. Now you didn't yeah, say well, I didn't say my way, view. I said the the ecumenical but, Christian view. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, so so I think that is uh, getting at this. A gentleman's yeah, question. See, but I, I don't take that to be philosophical. I mean, I take that to be the church's creed based on its reading of scripture, but, but, but this is realism. But okay, so the Summa Theologica is not the church's creed? I mean, it's, it's no, it's not the church's creed. It's Thomas's elaboration of his own philosophical articulation of the Christian faith, but, but he starts from scripture and he comments on Lombard, and, and, and so this is like four levels removed from the doctrine of the church. He doesn't contradict it, he explicates it. But I'm not quite sure that, you know, Thomas's notion of this subtle body that's going to be able to sort of float around and stuff like this um, is the way it's gonna be. I mean, that looks to me like it's a little, little Aristotelian science in there a little. <laughs> 